I bring you greetings once again in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise God for bringing us to the fourth meeting of this week-long revival program. I want to really thank God for the privilege that he gave me to minister God's word to you to a congregation like this, which is thirsty and which is hungry after the ministry of God's word. It is to what extent the people of God are hungry and thirsty for God's word. To that extent, the flow of God's word from the minister of God will always be there. And during the course of these uh, three days of ministry to you, I would like to honestly confess that I was tremendously blessed in the sense, the Bible says, he who waters shall be watered himself. And the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. And as I have been giving to you during these three days, the Lord in his mercy and grace blessed me with lots of fresh revelations of his word every time I sat with the meditation of these messages. Some of the messages which I have preached here have already been preached in several places. I believe in uh, uh, preaching my sermons again and again. Usually I preach uh, any sermon at least a dozen times before I sit to write an article on the subject. So someone said that when you prepare a message, you understand 50% and the remaining 50% you understand when you keep on delivering the sermon. That's the experience of uh, the teachers of God's word. So I wait for preaching of a message at least six or 12 times. By then I get a real grip and grasp on the subject and then I sit to write because what is written will be written. So you need to be extremely cautious before you commit yourselves to black and white. So that has been my practice all these years. That's how uh, most of my messages, what I have published though through the magazine and through the books, have been sermons that I have preached on various occasions. And several of you asked me a question during the time I met with you personally and also when I visited your homes for your hospitality, uh, how I prepare my sermons. Now, that itself will become a sermon. So I would suggest that um, you visit my website, www.stanleyonbible.com. And there we have, my, my, name, my name has to be spelled as S-T-A-N-L-E-Y, not L-Y. So L-E-Y, uh, uh, stanleyonbible.com. And there is an article under the leader's column titled, How I Preach. So there I have opened up some of my personal um, ministerial methods of preparing messages and proclaiming the truths of God's word from pulpits. I'm sure that you will be tremendously blessed by the insights that I have given because they all have been born uh, from the anvil of experience. I never had the privilege of walking into a theological seminary. I wish I had. But most of my studies have been a personal study. So I believe that a ministry like this will be a tremendous encouragement for uh, non-seminarians, uh, the so-called lay people. So you too can do it. Only thing is you need to do a lot of uh, painstaking labor. You need to study the Bible with sweat and labor and many times with tears. So the rich truths of God's word will come up and you need to prepare them as a fully cooked meal and serve it to the people of God. One of the scripture texts I have found in the Old Testament is that he who uses the sword of the Lord <coughs> casually is cursed. The word of the Lord is the sword of God and we should not be casual about anything that we need to do in the ministry of God's word. We need to study, re-study, search, research, write, rewrite, prepare, edit, and bring it to a shape until we know for sure that at the moment I cannot do anything better. And then only you should come to the pulpit. That has been my practice all these years. I thank God for that and I have passed it on to several of the junior ministers whom I have ministered to in the leadership development program over the years. And they all have found it very helpful. May the Lord bless you, especially those of you who are cell leaders. And you have got your own ministry responsibility, though not on a large scale. But even on one-to-one -one or to small groups, if you are faithful in small things, 
the Lord pro will promote you for the responsibility of larger things. That has always been God's principle. There is no other way. Anything with the kingdom of God begins small, but be faithful at it and the Lord will expand it. Christian life or Christian ministry is always a walk. It is not a jump and it is not a lift either. So that is what we should always remember. One of the words that you would have found frequently uh, coming out in the course of my messages has been balance. Now when I use that word balance, you should not think I talk about neutrality. Now balance does not mean neutrality. When you keep something neutral, you don't move anywhere. You come to a standstill. By balance we mean for any truth and any doctrine, there, is al there are always two sides, which permit me to call as two extremes. Two sides, two extremes, as a pendulum swings to two sides. By balance I mean, you take both the extremes into consideration, grip them and bring them into a proper tension. It's not neutral. You take both the extremes and bring them to a proper tension and stay put there. Otherwise, you go to eccentric emphasis of any particular truth and go to extremes and in course of time go off tangent. That is what has happened to many ministries and ministers of God and that has led lots of God's children astray and miserably led them into a web of deception where they are not able to receive any more fresh insights or revelations from God's word. I thought I should give you this understanding of that word balance because I seem to be very frequently using that word in the course of my talks to this congregation. Now this evening I have a very important subject with me. That's about relationships. On the first day I spoke to you about worship. Second day I spoke to you about guidance, the leading of the Lord. And then last but one evening I spoke to you about demonic or evil spirits and how we can overcome them. Today I move to another subject and that is interpersonal relationships. Interpersonal relationships. We have relationship problems everywhere. We have relationship problems in families. We have relationship problems in fellowships. We have relationship problems in factories. Wherever there are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, Relationship problems abound and they are in plenty. Whether it is a worship place or it is a work spot. Relationship problems simply abound. Especially as we move towards the end of the end time. Last day of the last days. The love of many grows cold. And people become self-pleasers. And self-denial becomes a forgotten discipline of Christian life. Even when we talk about the cross of Christ, we talk more about the benefits of the cross of Christ rather than the demands of the cross of Christ. Follow me carefully. Now if you have taken to consideration or review some of the messages that you have read and some of the sermons that you have heard about the meditations of the cross of Christ, you would find the focus or the emphasis has been mainly on the blessings and the benefits of the cross of Christ or the blood of Christ. And very rarely there is a reference to the demands and the challenges of the cross of Christ. That again, there is an imbalance. But the Lord Jesus Christ made it very clear in no uncertain terms, unequivocally, if any man wants to be my disciple, let him 
take up his cross daily. Let him deny himself and follow me. Very sadly and unfortunately, the self-denial aspect of cross-bearing is totally set aside and it is replaced by self-development programs. But Jesus did not call people for self-development, but he called people for self-denial. I must decrease so he might increase. John the Baptist, of whom Jesus testified, of those who are born among women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. Why? He was not a light. He was not a shining light either. But he was a burning and shining light. Our problem is we want to shine without burning. We want to shine without burning and melting and decreasing like a candle. Now these are pictures which I wanted to paint on your minds before I go to my subject proper. That is about relationships. It is only by self-denial through the deep work of a cross in our lives we can properly relate to one another as God desires and as God has designed for us in his holy writ. To begin with, turn with me the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, reading from verse 32. There we read the apostolic injection for a right interpersonal relationship in the context of God's people gathering together, either in small groups or as large congregations. Beginning with the last words of Ephesians 4, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. The standard is set. I am not to compare my interpersonal relationship with other people, saying that I am after all better than most of the people in my group, but just as God in Christ has forgiven you, so forgive one another. Therefore be followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. That is where the self-denial begins. Given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. You see how he talks about being kind, being tender hearted, forgiving one another and Christ offering himself as a sacrifice and sweet smelling offering unto God. Are you able to connect it? No self denial means no proper interpersonal relationship. The same thing we have in book of Philippians. In fact, in Ephesians, Colossians and Philippians, there are a lot of repetitions of the same truth. If only you would take time to read all the epistles of Apostle Paul. Why? Only Paul. Also Peter and John. You find a large portion of their writings was allotted to improve interpersonal relationship among God's people. Because as I told you, in the context of the other side of worship, I spoke to you about loving relationships in which I said, most of us have no problem with the vertical dimension of our Christian life. That vertical staff of the cross, man with God. But our problem comes in the horizontal plane. When it is a question of man relating to man, a cross without the horizontal stop is not a cross at all. That is another cross. That is another gospel. And the person who perhaps was crucified in that cross while there was no horizontal stop is another Jesus. It is always glory to God in the highest and goodwill towards men. Look at Philippians. 
And second chapter, I'll read from verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. How can you do it? He goes on to verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in their appearance as a man. So for proper interpersonal relationship, this emptying of oneself or the denying of, denying of oneself is an absolute prerequisite. If I ask you to recite for me John 3.16, I am sure every one of us would be able to say it. Will we all say that together? God so loved the world that he gave up his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now come on. 1 John 3.16. Anybody? Now there are always, I told you, there are mirror images, there are maids, there are pairs for every scripture passage. Now we know John 3.16, but I want you to look at 1 John 3.16 this evening. Because that forms the basis of our message tonight. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Amen? Amen. Very difficult. John 3.16 we have memorized. How many of you can now recite 1 John 3.16? Any of you? 1 John 3.16? You understand why I say there is a lot of imbalance in Christendom? We got stuck with John 3.16. But here there is a doctrinal and practical interpretation of John 3.16. By this we know love. God so loved. But how do we understand that love? Christ laid his life for us, so we also should lay our lives for our brothers. Same thing. No less requirement. No less requirement. Jesus never ever diluted the demands of discipleship. He never made easy believism. He never put things into one, two, three steps and nothing more. He always said, deny, unless you deny, you cannot be my disciple. I am here to tell you that love for others, love for one another is the acid test for our love for God. If you believe it, say Amen. Amen. Acid test. There is no second thought about it. And let me also add, love for one another is the solid proof, solid proof, indisputable proof that we are born again. Amen. It's so fundamental. Turn with me to First John again. Look at the fourth chapter. I read to you from verse 7 to 12. Today I will have to read lots of scripture passages because I feel that I must read them to you to make you understand not only the importance, but also the seriousness of the subject that I am talking about. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love, will you please complete that for me? Does not know God. God. There is no compromise about it because God is love. It is in this love God was manifested towards us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. John now ties up John 3.16 into his epistle and he says in verse 11 Beloved Beloved, you know already he started a letter and you say Beloved in the beginning but in the course of that letter, you again, you say, Beloved, that means he wants another fresh attention to a topic, to a subject. Beloved, brothers, beloved, if God so loved us, 
we also ought to love one another. Then he goes into an important doctrine. No one has seen God at any time. So don't try to see God. Don't try to ask God, Lord, give me. I want to see you. You, you cannot see him. No one has seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God abides in us. That means you cannot see God, but you can have God. You understand? You cannot see God, but you can have God. How can you have God? Huh? If you love one another, God abides with us. God doesn't visit us. He doesn't make shunting trips between heaven and our hearts. He abides with us. He doesn't commute. He stays with us. He abides with us. So we cannot see God, but we can. We can have God when we love God one another come to verse 20 and 21 of the same chapter he further amplifies it if someone says you know if someone confesses I love God <laughs> and hates his brother you know sometimes we say brother um, I don't actually hate him I just don't love him <laughs> come on you follow me carefully I don't hate him, uh, I just don't love him. Now, you must be a dictionary Johnson to find a word between love and hate. <laughs> there is no word between love and hate. Either you love someone or you hate someone. Okay, that, is, that is the logic, that is the premises on which the apostle builds this doctrine. If someone says I love God, but does not love his brother as much as he loves God, or as much as God loved him, he is a... He is a liar but he who does not love his brother whom he has seen here the apostle throws a challenge how can he love God whom he has not seen this commandment is not a suggestion mind you this is a commandment this commandment we have from him that he who loves God ah, must must. It's not an option. He who loves God must love his brother also. In this talk of this evening, I want to give you five don'ts for improving interpersonal relationships. And I want to honestly confess how much I have been struggling in this area of interpersonal relationship. I won't say I have attained or I have graduated, but I know the work of the cross continues in my heart deeper and deeper as I grow in my spiritual life every day. So these lessons I want to share with you, not just to excite you, but in order to edify you, encourage you and exhort you and with this practical counsel to equip you. Five don'ts for improving relationships. This won't be an expository sermon, but this will be a practical talk. Number one, do not offend anyone. Do not offend anyone. Turn with me to the important passage for this truth in Matthew's Gospel, 18th chapter, where the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking about offenses that come into the world. He read, he said from verse 6 to 10, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hang around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. Offenses must come. They are inevitable. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. If your right hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. 
It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or feet to be cast into everlasting fire. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It's better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast to hellfire. Take heed that you do not despise one of the little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Sometimes we mistake these words because we don't try to understand what Jesus meant by little ones. If you are an offense to one of these little ones, I don't think Jesus was speaking only about the age group, that small children. Of course, he included the little children here. But it is more than that because we read, one of these little ones who believe in me. That means they are not kindergarten. They are people who attained the age of accountability. One of these little ones who believe in. So that word little ones mean people who belong to the average and below average status in society. Normally, they are the people whom we will despise. How do we despise? We despise by using hard words on them. Shall I tell you what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount? Don't call anyone a fool or a rascal. If you call so, you are worthy of worthy of hellfire. I want to tell you something. How you can stop calling anyone a fool or an idiot or stupid? We are all fools, but only in different subjects. <laughs> we are all ignorant, only in different subjects. Isn't it? Isn't it? So if you realize it, you will never ever call anyone a fool or an idiot or a rascal. And hurting by unkind remarks, one day I walked into the reception counter of a huge Christian organization to meet with the director. The receptionist met with me and she asked me to be seated because there were other people who were talking to the director. And while I was seated there, I was looking at this receptionist. She had bobbed her hand. Her haircut was like a man, not even up to the shoulder. So in my own way and style, I was trying to become very critical. Why did this great man keep a person of this sort here at the receptionist counter? So I was about to pass a cutting remark before entering the office or exiting the office. But in a polite way, I wanted to say that. I acted like a man. That's what I was about to tell her. But when I went near her, I found she had no fingers in both her hands. She was a treated leper and she had lost all her ten fingers from her two palms. I was so broken and I was literally shattered. I had already judged her in my heart. I only did not pass on the words of judgment. I didn't verbalize my judgment, but the judgment was already internalized. I was terribly ashamed. Don't be quick in judging people. People have their own problems, which you may not know. Don't despise them because of their status or because they are juniors, or they are beginners, and less experienced than you. You know what Jesus said? Don't despise them, because their angels are always before the Father in heaven. Each of us have got angels, right? 
You see the kind of logic Jesus brings. Right in the portals of heaven, right in the courtyard of heaven, angels for each of God's people are there presenting their cases and needs. So don't ever despise anyone. And Jesus said, if your right hand offends you, it is in this context. Maybe to respect that person and to uphold that person both in your heart and your word may be very excruciating like cutting off your hands and plucking off your eyes and amputating your legs. Better you do it than entering hell with all your organs intact. Is that not what Jesus has said there? Is that not what he has meant there? How serious the matter of despising is to the extent he says, it's better you are amputated. It's better you are, your eyes are plucked away. Dear brothers and sisters, allow the cross of Jesus Christ to work deeply in your life. Do you know where Jesus Christ made this statement of offense? Look at the 18th chapter first words. There was some discussion among the disciples and they brought that question to the Lord Jesus Christ. Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And then he was taking a little child and he began to discuss. But you know in what context Jesus Christ dealt with this issue? I would like you to read 17th chapter 24 to 27 when you find time. It is always necessary to understand a difficult truth to go to a few verses that go before and the few verses that follow after. Jesus called Simon. Whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their own sons or strangers? Peter said, it's from strangers. Then Jesus said, in that case, sons are free. Nevertheless, look at the 27th word. Nevertheless, lest we offend them. Underline that word offend and connect it to the 18th chapter offense. So he is developing a subject. So what Jesus was trying to say was, those of us who are seniors, those of us who are elders, those of us who are mature and those of us who are in none, some leadership responsibility, we should take extra care and caution lest we offend any of those who observe us by our bad example. That's the truth. Jesus Christ was beginning to expound and bring out in this passage. That's why Apostle Paul said, I know that idol is nothing. I know idol is a non-entity. It is a non-thing, according to Paul. It is nothing. But nevertheless, if I go and be seated in a dinner that is served in an idol temple, and one of the new believers sees me being seated there, his tender conscience will be offended and I will be causing him to sin. So if eating of meat will offend my brother, forever I will abstain from eating meat. So what is important is not satisfying yourself and what is important is to exemplify your life before someone who observes it. Do not offend anyone. And that is not possible without denying ourselves of even some of the legitimate blessings of life. Secondly, do not do tit for tat. Do not do tit for tat. You know, doing tit for tat is an inborn nature for all of us, isn't it? You take an African child, or an American child, or an Asian child, or an Australian child, or an Arabian child, whatever. Just first standard, or kindergarten. If 
one child steals pencil, the other child the next day will steal eraser. You don't have to teach. Even before ABC is taught, you do this, I will do that for you. Now that is the Adamic nature. It is there in all of us. But the second Adam has given us a different example. The first Adam has given us a very bad example and imprint, ingrained. But the second Adam has given us totally a different example as we meet him in 1 Peter 2nd chapter. 1 Peter 2nd chapter, I will read to you from verse 21 onwards. For this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Underline that word, leaving us an example. That you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in turn. When he suffered, he did not threaten. <laughs> you know, sometimes what we do, if only I had not been born again. Huh? You regret that you have been born again? <laughs> huh? Why do you say that? You know, that statement should not come. He did not threaten. But committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Now here the healing does not refer to bodily physical healing. No. Because the context is totally different. It speaks about sins. It speaks about righteousness. And the very next words, you are like sheep going astray, but now return to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. There is no reference to our bodily healing here. It is about transforming the Adamic nature that is in us. We are, we are deceased. We are deceased. We are dwarfed. We are warped. We don't have the image of God. We have lost it. We have lost the glory of God. So here there comes an active healing that comes on our lives. And every stripe of Jesus is to teach us. One man asked him, What is that scar in your hand? And Jesus would answer, These are the wounds I received in the house of my friends. I would like you to find that words when you get back home in the book of Zechariah. These are the wounds that I received in the house of my friends. Never ever for any reason for that matter, do tit for tat. Don't behave like Peter. Jesus said, He who takes the sword will fall or die by the sword. Peter might have wondered, It is the Lord who said, Take the sword, isn't it? Jesus was asked this question, Master, we have two swords. Are they enough? Jesus said, enough. Now Peter was beginning to wonder and worry. What is the use of swords if you don't use swords? <laughs> two swords are there. Let me take one sword. But you know how miserably he missed the aim? He wanted to hit on the head. But he missed the aim and just chopped off the ear blade. Nothing happens if you chop off someone's ear blade, you'll continue to hear. You know, many times that's what we do. You have the sword, but the sword should not be used. It must be kept inside the sheath. He did that to me. You see what I'm going to do to that person. 
having sword in your sheaths, but not drawing out of the sheaths, that demands tremendous Christian character and maturity. Using the sword does not need any Christianity. It needs tremendous maturity and self-control and walk with God. Having two swords but never taking it out. Just recollect in the past how many times you drew the sword from your sheath. At least you threatened the person. Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, 5th chapter, where the Lord Jesus Christ so beautifully brings out this truth. From verse 38 to 41, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was Old Testament, Old Covenant. But I tell you, not to resist or revile an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, Turn him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him take your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Brothers and sisters, we need to tell the world that Christianity is a religion of second mile. Amen? Amen. That is why we are going to score. No other religion teaches it. That is why Mahatma Gandhi was stuck with the sermon on the mount and he fell in love with it. And he said, no Hindu is a complete Hindu until he reads and meditates the sermon on the mount of Jesus Christ. I am only quoting Gandhi. And that is what Jesus said. Christianity is a religion of second mile. But the world is characterized by Lamech spirit. You know Lamech? Anything comes to your mind when I say Lamech? Anything? Okay, there was a man called Lamech. We'll meet him today. Very rarely we meet him. <laughs> Genesis. Come with me to Genesis 4th chapter. I will read to you from verses 23 and 24. 23 and 24 of Genesis. Very interesting passage. Then Lamech said to his wives, <laughs> Eda and Zilla. I don't know how many wives he had, but he had A to Z wives. <laughs> Eda and Zilla. He spoke to his wives. Hear my voice. I was a champion talking in front of his women. Oh, wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. <laughs> what an oration. Huh? Listen to my speech. What was the speech? I have killed a man for wounding me. <laughs> oh, no. He wounded me and I finished him. And even a young man for hurting me. He spoke the one bad word. I finished him. I just turned his neck and I finished him. And then this man continues his oration. If Cain shall be avenged the sevenfold, huh, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. <laughs> this is Lamech spirit. Let us not have the spirit of Lamech, but let us possess the spirit of the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. The spirit of Lamech is prevalent all over the world. The world is filled with the spirit of Lamech. And God calls us to show a difference. No more Lamech. We have the Lamb of God who carries other sins on him and goes outside the camp outside the city, bearing the reproach of the world, and to die there. How can you avoid doing tit for tat? Try to do some positive good to someone who hurts you. 
Don't remain passive, but do something positive. Just remaining passive is very dangerous. That person spoke against me, I'm holding my mouth. That person did this thing against me, I'm just going to be silent and I'm going to withdraw myself. That I tell you is not Christian. You're only trying to protect yourself. There is no self-denial. You are interested in protecting yourself. That is psychological. You're trying to give a comfortable psychological treatment to you. But that's not the, what the Bible says. The Bible wants us to do something positive. What did Jesus say? Bless those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. It doesn't say if somebody curses you, you don't say anything. You just go silently. No, that's not Christianity. Follow me carefully. That doesn't help you. Do some positive good. It is not passivism or passivity, but it is being positive. You know, in mathematics, we use that uh, for positive or in electricity, we use that symbol, cross. That's the message of the cross. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Now these are all in Matthew 5.44. I'm only trying to explain step by step. Matthew 5.44 must be memorized by everybody. Do good to those who hate you. Not just those who help you. And pray for those who speak ill of you. You know when somebody speaks bad about you. If you start praying for that person, I guarantee, I assure you that that hill and the mount of hatred will begin to melt like ice before sunrise. It has happened. This is the experience. There is no other way. You try to do anything else, it, the root of bitterness only take deep depth. But when somebody abuses you, you take that person before God and you pray for that person. You see bitterness melts away like wax before fire. But this will not naturally come. You need to take a conscious effort. It doesn't come automatically just because you are converted and just because you are filled with the spirit. These things do not come automatically. You need to take conscious effort. <laughs> Never ever do tit for tat. The third counsel I would like to give you to improve interpersonal relationship. Do not avoid difficult persons. <laughs> so many broad smiles immediately. <laughs> do not avoid difficult persons. You know, one of the ways that God employs to shape our character is to keep us with difficult. Can you give me a scripture text for that? <coughs> Anybody? Anybody, can you give me a scripture text for that? Yes, that's right. Turn with me to book of Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs 27, verse 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance or the character or the behavior or the quality of his friend. As iron sharpens iron. I will serve you some examples, then you will understand. What was Jacob? He was a cheat. He was a deceiver. He was a supplanter. God put Jacob with Laban. He already had an MD degree. MD means Master of Deception. <laughs> See? Right, Father in law. Right, father-in-law. And you wanted the father-in-law. 
for to get that father in law you were ready to work for 14 years you got it finally full fledged father in law you know the meaning of that word laban white the root meaning is deception so the very name of laban was he was a deceiver he will outwit his son in law just imagine father in law master of uh, uh, deception and uh, uh, son in law attaining mastery in deception <laughs> see how both of them together iron sharpens iron <laughs> there was john in the new testament he was the son of thunder isn't it son of thunder god put john with simon peter simon peter was a rock <laughs> isn't it you are simon simon means peter is petra rock i often used to wonder these two were men of opposite temperaments one a son of thunder the other was a son of slumber why you put peter anywhere he will comfortably sleep <laughs> anywhere you put paul in prison he will sing you put peter in prison he will sleep <laughs> even after the angel of the lord wakes him up peter will stand up and standing he will be sleeping <laughs> what which bible says it my bible says it. because the angel said please tie up your lungi the angel said <laughs> isn't it he was standing and so and then he was walking and sleeping you know some of us have sleep walk how do you say he was walking and sleeping he didn't know that he has come to the gate <laughs> only after reaching the gate he began oh this is what has happened see how god puts people together difficult persons no these things may look like a joke but i think there's a lot of truth in it this is how god puts people together and god put mary with martha Mary was a lover of meditation and Martha was fond of cooking see how god put two people together and he put another two women together you want to see those two women please meet them in philippians fourth chapter philippians fourth chapter two women such an important epistle and paul mentions these two women because there was constant fight between these two ladies in the church for two i implore i plead with yodia and i implore sintake to be of the same mind in the lord hmm. huh? i think this is not a good english you should say i implore yodia and sintake that's good english but it says i implore yodia and i implore sintake so much they were fighting against each other this language look at the language there is a stress in each i plead with peter and i plead with john it is not i plead with peter and john i plead with peter and i plead with john so much was the conflict between these two ladies the meaning of the word yodia is fragrance she was an artistic person but the meaning of sintake is fortunate that is materialistic person one was artistic and the other is materialistic and god wanted both of them together and they figure out in the very epistle where paul was writing about oneness and shall i give another example god puts husbands with wives <laughs> any exposition necessary god puts husbands with wives you wonder why did i marry this man of all the men in the world and vice versa of all the men in 
many women in the world, how did I choose this person? Shall I tell you what? Because you are a very difficult person. The only way to improve your character is to bring another equally or even more difficult person into your life. I hope some of you have got the answer. This is the truth. Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral. He was crucified between two criminals. Crucifixion itself was bad enough. That itself was cruel enough. He was crucified between two criminals. Even in death, he had to be with the difficult people. Don't try to jump up off your situation like a marble, but stay put. There was a carpentry shop. It was morning 10.30, the carpenter went out for a coffee break. There was a big argument and dispute and fight among the tools in the carpentry shop. All the tools came to the hammer and said, Mr. Hammer, you are too noisy, you must get out. But the hammer said to the chisel, I cannot get out. You chisel, you must get out because you are too sharp. You are always cutting people. But the chisel said, I will not go. The foot rule should go because he is always measuring people. He is a perfectionist. But the foot rule said, I will not go. The screwdriver should go because he is always interfering into other people's matters. But the screwdriver said, I will not go. The plane should go because he is too shallow. And the fight was going on. The carpenter returned to his carpentry shop. He took all these tools. He made a cross and he died on the cross. Brothers and sisters, we need each other. So let us not needle each other. You are not complete by yourself. You need other persons in your life. I know how difficult a truth I am preaching to you tonight. Any other exercise in Christian life is easy. But accepting difficult persons in our lives as God has put them without avoiding them is excruciating. It's excruciating. I don't find a better word, so I use the word excruciating. Turn with me to First Chronicles to see a text which has always been a great encouragement to me. First Chronicles 19th chapter I will read to you verses 10 to 13, a passage which we should just sink into our hearts and spirits. When Joab saw that the battle line was set against him before and behind, he chose some of the choice men of Israel and put them in battle array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he put under the command of Abishai, his brother, and they set themselves in battle array against the people of Ammon. Then he said, Oh, these are words which can be engraved on gold. Then he said, If the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the people of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Shall I read that again? If the Syrians are too strong for me, then you come and help me. If the people of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Be of good courage. Let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. If only 
Christians can say like this to one another. If only Christian ministers can say like this to one another. If only pastors and preachers can say again like this to one another. Brother, while you are weak, I will help you. While I am weak, you help me. We can't compete with each other. We must compliment each other. We should not fight with each other. We should felicitate each other. If only we could have that spirit of Job and Abishai. Much, 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 much more than what we are all able to do today can be accomplished for the kingdom of God. We can do for the people of God. But what a waste. Because of duplicity. Because of cutthroat competitions. Because we are not ready to work in cooperation. Because we are over independent. Because each one wants to build his own empire rather than building the kingdom of God. When this will plague leave Christendom? Will not God shower his reign of healing on this ill and the sick and the sleek and the anemic and the anathemic Christendom? of our times and bring it back to where it should be because the church that is is not the church that was and the church that is is not the church that it should be we need each other even Jesus wanted the help of his two three disciples stay here while I go and pray on that I cannot face this alone You are not complete in yourself. So don't avoid especially difficult person. It is easy to accept delight some persons, but it is difficult to accept difficult persons, but we must do it because it is part of God's program in our lives. Self-denial. Fourthly, do not withhold Forgiveness to anyone. As I am speaking to you, I know tonight God will bring several individuals before your mind with whom you should set matters right. And decide then and there in the presence of God that at the earliest you will reconcile matters with them and restitute matters with them. Do not withhold forgiveness to anyone. Forgiveness is more easily said than done. Turn with me to a passage where the apostles realized how difficult it was to forgive one another. Look at the 17th chapter of Luke, every one of you. I read from verse 3. Take ye to yourselves, Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Hmm, it's very difficult. So immediately we read in the fifth verse, Oh Lord, if this is what is wanted of us and demanded of us, you better increase our faith. You know, many times we ask the Lord, Lord, increase my faith, but we forget the context. You need more faith to forgive someone who keeps on hurting you than performing miracles. Seven times in a day, you want me to forgive that person? Then the present level of faith I have is not sufficient. You better increase my faith. See where he makes the prayer. And what was the answer Jesus said? If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea. It shall be done. In other words, Jesus said, 
you start forgiving small offenses, it becomes easy for you to forgive greater offenses. And that's the meaning of the passage. This is what is meant by contextual interpretation of the scriptures. I want you to learn to interpret the Bible. As a Bible teacher, it's my responsibility not just to give you this and that, but make you also interpret the script. That's why I take so much time to and, and, and I exercise with you. You don't need an increase of faith. You need an exercise of faith. Put that little faith you have into action and it will grow. You understand? That is the meaning of that passage. Unless, let me say again, unless we allow the cross of Jesus Christ to work deeply in our lives, this is not going to be possible. Someone said, Jesus died for us, so we don't need to die. No, Jesus died for us, so we should die. The cross is a symbol of God's forgiveness. We say there are seven sayings of Christ on the cross. The very first saying is a prayer of forgiveness. Ah, they forgive them. That means Jesus forgave them. Jesus first of all forgave them. There was no root of bitterness in his heart against his Roman executors. So he could ask the father, I have forgiven them. But unless you forgive him. Stephen prayed, Lord, forgive him. And the man who was chiefly responsible for the execution and the martyrdom of Stephen was converted and he became an apostle because his prayer was heard. Forgive him. You know why we find it difficult to forgive? We have a question. Follow this question carefully. You know what that question is? How can he do this against me? 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 One, two, three. I have given you three stresses. How can he do this against me? One. How can he do this against me? That is two. How can he do this against me? That is three. Usually our problem is on these three words. One, two, three. The only way to sort it out is how God forgave us in spite of whatever we have done against him. Number one. How can he do this against me? If God asks the question, I am the creator. I am the Lord. I am the king. I am the owner. How can you sin against me? And God, suppose he holds grudge, where we shall be? Second, how can he do this against me? God will say, you are just dust, you are just clay. How can you sin against me if God says it? What will happen? How can he do this against me? How many innumerable in things? I can't hold my breath any longer. My sins and transgressions are more in number than the sand particles of the sea. That's about me. How about you? Is it true? They are more in number than the sands of the seashore. They are more than the hair of our head. If God wants to accept us on the same terms as we set for people to be accepted, none of us will be seated here. 
would have been condemned long, long ago. That is why Jesus said, Forgive one another as my Father has forgiven you. Fifthly and lastly, do not hold blessings selfishly. Do not hold blessings selfishly. One of my favorite authors and missionaries is Amy Carmichael, a great saintly lady who founded the Star Fellowship in Donauwur, where most of the missionaries of Indian, most of the children of Indian missionaries are studying. And this is what that great saintly woman said. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Christ so loved us that he gave himself for us. That was the greatest miracle of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came on the disciples. They all began to speak in tongues. That is Acts 2.4. People say that is Pentecostal experience. People say that is full gospel experience. According to me, that is half gospel. Acts 2.4 is half gospel. You know what is full gospel? Acts 2.4 becomes complete only when you come to Acts 2.44. Acts 2.44 makes Pentecostal experience complete. Now all who believed were together and had all things in. That's true Pentecostals. How did it happen? People were going to River Jordan to be baptized by that rugged preacher. He was not polished in his language. Everything about him was supernatural. There was nothing synthetic about him. His dress was not synthetic. His diet was not synthetic. His doctrine also was not synthetic. Everything was supernatural, dynamic. And people came to him, what shall we do? You have two, give one. You have more than what you need, give that. Several of them didn't want to be baptized by that man because this was too much. They just went away. They were hesitating to submit themselves to this truth of sharing with others. Something happened. What could dodge under water baptism could not dodge under fire baptism. You can dodge under water baptism. You can enter water baptism as a dry sinner and come out as a wet sinner. That's very easy. But here was not a water baptism. Here was a fire baptism. He shall baptize them with the Holy Ghost and fire. So when they were baptized with fire, all their attachment, the strings of attachment to earthly things were severed, burnt away. When they saw the eternal glory, their grip on the earthly gold was loosened. Amen? Amen. No apostle told them to sell your possessions and your properties and your belongings and bring it and put it on my feet. No apostle ever gave that instruction. It was spontaneous and voluntary. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Oh Lord, do it again. Oh Lord, do it again. Amen. You're afraid like Ananias and Sapphira? <laughs> oh Lord, do it again. Amen. A man who is crucified on the cross because both his hands are stretched and nailed, he cannot hold anything in his hand. He is crucified. 
I'm keeping this picture before your mind. He's crucified. He cannot hold anything because he's crucified. He's already nail pierced. This is cross bearing. I'm not talking about wearing the cross. I'm talking about bearing the cross. If you die with Christ, and if you have risen with Christ, set your mind on things above and not on the things of the earth. Come with me to 1 John 3rd chapter, where the apostle crystallizes his teaching to more practical terms. And makes it very, very clear. We started with 1 John 3.16. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. What does it mean? What is the meaning of laying down your life for your brothers? Look at 17th verse. Whoever has this world's goods. And sees his brother in need. And shuts up his heart from him. How does the love of God abide in him? My little children, he was not writing to a Sunday school. When John was writing this epistle, he was 90 plus. So anybody in the congregation was little children for him. <coughs> so my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. It's easy to be enjoying sermons. Even sermons on interpersonal relationships but what are we going to do when we get back home I want to send you with a warning 33rd chapter of Ezekiel 33rd chapter of Ezekiel verses 30 to 32 everybody look at that passage otherwise it's very easy to become a hypocrite even after listening to your message like this. Ezekiel 33, 30 to 32. As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses and they speak to one another. Everyone saw his brother. Please come and hear what the word that is coming from the Lord. Come listen to the special meetings. Special messages of this week long revival program. Come! So they come to you as people do and sit before you as my people in the Bread of Life Fellowship. And they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love. With their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. This passage I picked up for this particular message because I am speaking on love. With your mouth you can say, I love you brother, I love you sister. But with their hearts they pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. Good sermon, well structured sermon, beautiful rhyming words, rhythmic. It's like a song or a pleasant voice or an instrument, but they hear your words, they do not do them. Let not what we read here in the book of Ezekiel happen to the members and the visitors of the Brother of Brother Life Fellowship here tonight. I don't want to be hard on you, but when the message of the Lord and the hand of the Lord come heavily upon me, I need to be faithful as a minister of God. If we cannot love those whom we have seen, how can we love God whom we have not seen? No one has seen God any time. But if we love our brothers, God abides with us. Do not offend anyone. Do not do tit for tat. Do not avoid difficult persons. Do not withhold forgiveness to anyone. Do not hoard blessings selfishly. If you honestly want 
to train and exercise and practice. These lessons in your life in the matter of interpersonal relationship. And you want to pray with me and the rest of God's people. Please stand up, not otherwise. Close your eyes. Bow your heads. To look into your own heart. The all-seeing eyes of God. The penetrating eyes of God. The scrutinizing eyes of God are open upon us tonight. Let's not deceive ourselves by just praying hearers only. Grace of God has come afresh to us tonight as the word of His grace was expounded to you. How we can improve relationship as a wife with your husband, as a husband with your wife, as parents with your children, and as children with your parents. As a boss with your subordinates, and as servants with your masters, as brothers and sisters in the family and church of God, as friends in your neighborhood, as members and relatives, close and distant in your family circle. And may come a question. No, I must be smart. Otherwise, people will take advantage of me. Shall I tell you something, my dear brother, my dear sister? It is not sin to be deceived. But it is sin if you deceive. It's not wrong to be cheated, but it is wrong if you cheat. Oh God, we stand before you realizing our failures, acknowledging our need of your fresh love to be outpoured into our hearts to love the unlovered to love the unlovables because Lord while we were yet sinners Christ died for us As your dear son laid his life for us, the call has come to us tonight to lay our lives for our brothers and sisters by embracing them and not eschewing them, by accepting them and not avoiding them. Father, Even the apostles, in response to a teaching like this, prayed to your son, increase our faith. We are this moment, because of the correction that was given to that prayer, we say, Lord, help us to exercise that faith that you have already planted in our hearts. Help us to forgive and forget small offenses as small as the master see that we may be able to deal and uproot a mulberry tree size of tree of bitterness.
Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your presence. But as we go back home, help us to restitute matters with those who we have wronged. In the stories, help us to humble ourselves so we may receive more of your grace.